So far in thinking about chemical reactions, we've focused on situations where only the forward reaction matters. So reactant A, for example, going to a product B. We didn't worry at all about the conversion of B back to the reactant A. And this is a very common situation in chemical reactions, but it might give us some pause, right? Because if we can just as well write the reaction A going to B, well, we can write the reaction B going to A. And here, B is now the reactant and A is the product. And it seems like if nature wants to do the conversion of A to B, then the conversion of B to A is something that nature, quote unquote, does not want to do. On the other hand, there are reactions and reaction systems where the conversion of A to B and the conversion of B to A are both important. And these are so-called reversible reactions or reversible reaction systems, a big focus of this chapter. We're really going to zero in on the situation in this chapter where a reaction doesn't go all the way to products at the state of what's called chemical equilibrium. When macroscopic change appears to stop, there's a little bit of A and a little bit of B left, a little bit of reactant and a little bit of product. This is a situation where chemical equilibrium is most important. And although it appears that things are static from the macroscopic scale, on the molecular level, a lot is still happening in a system in chemical equilibrium. And we can take advantage of that and, and harness that and use that idea to make predictions about what's going to happen to a system in equilibrium when we apply a stress to it or when we change conditions somehow. So this chapter is all about fundamental concepts of chemical equilibrium and the fundamental conceptual tools and problem solving strategies we use to tackle equilibrium problems. We've got four sections. In the first section, we're going to introduce the concepts of chemical equilibrium, really the underlying conceptual model. And this is really, really important, actually. Having that right mental picture of a system in chemical equilibrium is going to give you good intuition when you're solving problems about whether, for example, your answer makes sense numerically. Does it make sense for a reaction to go forward or backward given conditions? For example, keep that conceptual foundation from section one in your mind throughout this chapter. In section two, we're going to introduce a key quantity for the study of chemical equilibrium known as the equilibrium constant. This is represented with a capital K in contrast to the lowercase k that we used in the kinetics chapter. And it's a measure of how much a reaction wants to go forward, quote unquote, based on the natural and really the thermodynamic situation associated with the reactants and products. In section three, we're going to see what happens when we take a system that begins in chemical equilibrium and apply some kind of change to the conditions, a so-called stress to the system. This is going to cause the reaction system to change in response to the change in conditions using an idea known as Le Chatelier's principle. And Le Chatelier's principle is really based on the dynamic nature of chemical equilibrium, a very important point that we'll return to later. Finally, in section four, we'll dig into the math. And this is one of the most common areas of struggle and something almost universally taught in introductory chemistry courses, how to do calculations related to systems in equilibrium. And an idea here in section four that we're going to see very early on is that where we would apply basic stoichiometry in problems where, for example, we wanted to know how much product we would end up with given an amount of reactant that we start with, that becomes impossible in reactions that don't go to completion or reversible reactions to apply directly stoichiometry because the reaction doesn't go all the way. So we can't assume that all of the reactants are converted to products. We're actually going to loop back to section two in the equilibrium constant and see how that plays into these equilibrium calculations in section four. Let's start with the conceptual underpinnings of chemical equilibrium. And the text introduces this sort of interesting metaphor of bathers on a beach. And the idea that as people, for example, are relaxing on the beach and they get hot, they're going to go into the water. Let's say we've got some water over here. At the same time, as bathers in the ocean get tired, they are going to leave the water and return to the beach. So there's some rate of sunbathers going into the water and some rate of ocean goers, ocean people, 
coming out of the water onto the beach. An equilibrium situation is one in which the two rates of people entering and leaving the water are equal. And the key conceptual point here is that there are still people going in and out of the water. But if we look at the numbers of people in and out of the water, they appear to be unchanging because the rates of going in and out are equal, a dynamic situation. We'll have another metaphor for this here in a second. The key to chemical equilibrium really and why we care about it is the idea of a reversible reaction. A reversible chemical reaction proceeds in both the forward and reverse directions. The products are not so much more stable than the reactants that the reaction goes all the way to products with no reactant left. Or vice versa, the reactants in fact may be more stable than the products, so the reaction hardly goes at all. For the most important reversible reactions, the rate constants for the forward and reverse reactions are both non-negligible, they're on a similar order of magnitude for example. And the slide gives two examples of irreversible and reversible reactions. The precipitation of silver chloride, which is the first reaction you see, is an example of an irreversible reaction. We can actually tell that from the reaction scheme based on this forward-only arrow right here that I've highlighted in blue. This indicates that for all practical purposes, all of the silver cations and chloride anions in aqueous solution get together and form silver chloride. And Assuming we've got the stoichiometric ratio right, no reactant remains at the end of the reaction. A very different situation is shown in the second case. HCN in aqueous solution is reacting with water to form CN minus, that's the cyanide anion, and H3O plus. Now here, the reaction arrow indicates both the forward and reverse directions are taking place. And this arrow highlighted in orange is a reversible reaction arrow. Just like the bathers on the beach, reactants are going to products and products are going to reactants in this reaction system. Specifically in a state of chemical equilibrium, the rates of the forward and reverse reactions are equal. And this is key to the definition of chemical equilibrium. So in general, for a reversible reaction system, the rates need not be equal, right? If we start only with HCN and water, we'll clearly only the forward reaction can take place. Likewise, if we start with only CN minus and H3O plus, only the reverse reaction can happen. Key to the state of equilibrium is that the rates of the forward and reverse reactions are equal to each other. This leads to a situation where the concentrations of reactants and products appear to be unchanging with time. So macroscopically, it looks like nothing is happening. However, on the microscopic level, these forward and reverse reactions are always occurring just like bathers going in and out of the ocean. 